Hello. Hello. Happy Monday. You got a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did get a haircut. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> All righty. How's everybody doing? Hey, Ray. Hey, Ray. I, I figured I figured we start off Monday with a pretty heavy discussion. You ready for it? Okay. Yeah. A little bit to kind of advance our thinking. Um, let me share my screen here. So, all right. So we're now into May, right? And so we should be hitting these topics. And what I thought would be good to do since we're first gonna focus on these disruptive technologies, mm -hmm. right? Artificial intelligence, advanced robotics, virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D printing, networks and sensors, digital biology. We're gonna hit these topics over the next several weeks. And I think there's, there's some underlying current that's enabling these list of technologies and others. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like, why would we pick these specific technology? What's unique about these? Mm -hmm. And so I want to give you guys kind of the fundamental understanding of what's the driver, what's the inherent driver, which are making these more powerful and exponential. Um, and so it's going to, it's basically looking at the empirical data. Let me tell you why I'm sharing this with you because at some point, you know, in your marketing business, Marco, mm -hmm. you might have someone, you might start saying you want to start introducing drone technologies for catching footage. Yeah. Which you guys are doing, right? Mm -hmm. If you would have just suggested that probably three, four years ago, people would have said, why are you wasting your time on that? I don't get it. I don't ever think that will be a thing. It's too expensive. But what they're not realizing, it's an exponential trending technology that in a matter of moments, you know, within a couple of years, it's going to be democratized and inexpensive to where someone like you with a small business can finally use drones, flying robots, mm -hmm. and, and do quality productions the way that Hollywood do it with helicopters, right? So that's a good example of, you know, if you don't think about, if you think these technologies are way far off, because four years ago, you might have thought they're way far off. I guarantee six, seven years ago, you would have, you know, before we were even talking about drones, it was only being used in the military. And there was some, some commercial use, but not like it is today, right? Where you can buy one off the internet, super cheap. Mm -hmm. They used to cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars years ago. So there's a reason why, um, that technology is coming down in price and getting better at an exponential pace. And, you know, those drones, if they don't have it already, the autonomous drones are going to have artificial intelligence in them. So they can actually understand what they're looking at and they can take the video footage for you. You won't have to keep manipulating it to get the right footage. It'll know based on the scene, how to focus and, and what objects to look at. So my, my point is there's, there's this underlying current that it's worth discussing. It's a little bit of a technical discussion, but it's not a scary discussion. Um, but I think once you understand this, you'll understand the, sure, the, the power of exponential thinking versus linear thinking. And where this will come in handy is one, it will help you guys as entrepreneurs, all of you start to think about what's a trend that today might, people are kind of balking at because they think it's all hyped up or they think it's science fiction, or they think it's way down in the future, where the reality is, I think if we understand this stuff, we can start using it now. And when it hits that curve and really takes off, we'll be in a really good pole position. We'll be in a primary position to take advantage of it competitively. Um, so we talked about, at our first session or second session, we talked about the convergence of all these exponential entrepreneur tools, right? The cost comes down, the size comes down, the access, the quality, the capability goes up. 
I use drones just because I know you guys have had firsthand experience with drones and you've used it in your own business. You know, for those that didn't hear the previous session, you know, um, who was it? Pablo, you're the one who got drone certified, right? For your marketing business. Yeah, FAA license. Yeah, so you got license certified. I mean, you really got to appreciate the fact that a few years ago, you know, you weren't going to have access and you wouldn't, the quality, the power, the cost, even the size, none of that was right to play with, right? If you go back five years, 10 years, these things were a lot larger. They weren't as sophisticated. They couldn't do as much. They cost a fortune. The quality was so-so. You know, so that one example that you've experienced just with drone technology in your, in your business, you got to realize that's happening all across the board. And there's a reason for it. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about, okay? Um, this is also the reason you see how many years it took for a typical Fortune 500 company to get to a billion dollar market cap. Market cap is market capitalization. It's what the company's worth in terms of its uh, its value on Wall Street, right? So it's a sign of investment. And you can see that over the years, and this is where the data, my friend Salim Ismail, who wrote the book Exponential Organizations, prepared this chart. But you can see up through 2012, which is when we, where this data tailors off, this is how many years it took to reach a billion dollar valuation, mm. right? And now some of these are like Uber, I think is, way past a billion, I think they were at, well, who knows today with coronavirus, but they were, I think they were at like 50 billion. But it's just speed, it's speed to, speed to value. You know, it doesn't take 20 years to build an empire. The other thing is the typical Fortune 500 company to reach that billion dollars required an army of people. You know, in some cases, tens of thousands of people. WhatsApp, Uber, Snapchat, if you look at these companies, they were founded and they reached a billion dollar valuation. Some of them, when they only had a handful of people, you know, some less than 10. Yeah. So it just puts in perspective for you, it's not business as usual anymore. It's very, very, very different place. And the reason being is they took advantage of Moore's law. So we're gonna talk about this for a second. I don't want you to get freaked out by a graph, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just pause and think about what's on the screen here because this is the underlying empirical data empirical data means data that proves something and this is going to be the proof of why you see these technologies taking off the way they do because there is an underlying reason okay along the bottom there you have years from 1900 Okay, so that's just decades up through the year 2010, basically. Along the vertical axis there, on the left, the vertical, it's calculations per second that $1,000 buys you. So what you see in this graphic, guys, is every dot represents what $1,000 buys you in computing power. And you can see across these 100 years, the different types of computers that there were that generated computer power or calculations per second, basically cr cranking bits and bytes. I mean, you, you start off in the, in the earliest part of the century with electromechanical computers, then there were relay computers, then there were vacuum tubes, and there were transistor computers, and there were integrated circuits. You guys are familiar with the term, the Intel Pentium chip, Intel chip that's in the computer? That's the integrated circuit. Intel's the brand. But this is basically, sorry, this is basically the evolution of computing over 100 years. It's just, it's like anything, like just like people evolve, computers have evolved and they keep getting faster and faster for a cheaper price. That's basically what this graphic is showing me, but this is actual data, okay? Mm -hmm. um, like that electromechanical one, I remember, and I'm gonna date myself here, but I remember <laughs> going to my father, who's a professor at a university. He taught at um, Virginia Tech 
for decades. And I remember going into the basement of the university where they had these computers the size of a house that would basically spit out a little digital card like you see there. And that digital card you'd have to bring to another place to, to have it read. I mean, it's just, it just crazy, right? And the thing was huge. Um, and so anyways, this is, computers have just continued to evolve and you can see that evolution taking place here. Yeah, I think another common one is um, storage space. So you think of it like your SD cards or, you know, flash drives. Um, I, you know, I, I've been using them like for, you know, since like probably middle school. But I know like you would have to, like the price, you know, and it wasn't like too much, but like, and Chris, you probably also know, like, but the price of like, a, I don't know, like an eight gigabyte, um, uh, like flash drive was probably like, I don't know, 25 bucks, uh, 30 bucks, 40 bucks yeah. in middle school. And now it's like, it's like what, $5 or it's just gotten so much cheaper. And now they sit on like, like they, they sell them in like bundles. So like they want you to buy more so that yeah. Yeah. you can get terabytes now yeah oh. so that's a perfect example what i'm doing here is look at and here's the funny part in my junk drawer here at my desk i've got like i've got like a bunch of these jump drives that used to cost you know 80 90 100 dollars for the storage space now they give them away at conferences stuff they used to pay hundreds of dollars for and by the way 10 years ago 15 20 years ago if you go back 20 years ago these were like thousands of dollars in terms of storage space, meaning having space to store. Now you can get, now it's basically free. You don't even need these because you can just save stuff to the cloud, right? Yeah. You know, and that's a, that's a really good example. And notice these are getting smaller too, right? They used to be bigger pieces of equipment. So yeah, I mean, the now, storage, they're, yeah. Now, they're in, now they're like in the cloud. You, they sell you, they, they're selling you uh, cloud storage now. So it's like, it's not even physical. It's almost yeah, you don't, even, you don't even need it anymore. It's not even physical. It, it, Peter DeMandis calls this it dematerialized. Mm -hmm. That you used to have a flashlight, you used to have a calculator, you used to have a TV, you used to have a radio. You used to, you know, now it's all de dematerialized into your phone. You don't carry any of that around now, right? So, I mean, it's, pretty an extra, it's a pretty extraordinary time to be a young person because the world's going to change much more in your lifetime than it did in my lifetime because of this. It's already, it's already happening. I mean, I've seen, you know, I, it used to be that it, it used to be a father or mother telling their son, you know, the statement, when I, used, when I was young like you, I used to do this, right? Now it's the older brother telling the younger sister, right? It's, you know, you have to wait a whole generation for the, the mother or father to be telling a young son. It's like five years later, you, you guys could be telling your younger brother, younger sister. When I was your age, you know what I mean? It's already that fast. So in the, in the case of, of video games, uh, my, my brother he used to play like Nintendo 64. You, he, grew up, he was born in the 90s. And like I grew up playing like, like Nintendo DS. Yeah. So he tells you. And you know, it's funny. Now you've got, you know, how many of you got a younger brother or sister? Because, you know, within a year or two, they're going to be telling you, you know, you're going to be saying to them, when I was your age, I couldn't go into a virtual world and play a game. Mm -hmm. Everything I played was on a screen. Yeah. And what's popular now is the cell phone. Everyone, all the, the young, the kids are like on their cell phones or tablets. So it's kind of funny. Yeah. And the calculations per second that's in your cell phone now is, you know, more superior than what the government had 20 years ago. Like literally it's got more computational power than probably president Clinton had access to as president mm -hmm. is now in everybody's cell phone. You know, it's just really extraordinary. And the data that supports that is, is this, this piece here. Now what's unusual about this graphic? I'm going to see who's a math student here. <laughs> what, what's interesting about this graphic? The cluster in the middle? Um, that is interesting, but I don't have an explanation for that. So guess again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see the, it's like to the, well, if we're talking about math, it's like to the power of something. Is, is that relevant? Yeah. So this is, this is on a log scale. Yeah. And the reason they had to do that, and I'm going to show you what it looks like when we take it off a log scale in a second. Um, this is, by the way, an updated version that, that's also on a log scale. 
log scale just means that it's, it's, okay, let me take a step back. When there was a scientist, his name was Gordon Moore, and he invented the Intel chip, okay, which is the current, where we currently are. And I don't remember what year it was exactly, maybe it was in the 70s or 80s. But Gordon Moore made a very famous statement that people call today Moore's Law. Do any of you, if you took a computer science class, it's one of the first things they teach you, but have any of you heard the term Moore's Law? I've heard it, but I didn't do so well on computer science. <laughs> it rings a bell though, right? So what Moore's Law is, and it's kind of interesting to think about, what Gordon Moore said when he created this Intel computer chip, he said, you know what, I think about every 12 to 18 months, with the work that we put into this to advance this technology, I'd say 12 to eight, every 12 to 18 months, I think we'll make this twice as strong, we'll double the power of this computer chip. Because we'll be able to put that much more in the silicon, like in terms of the integrated circuits, we'll be able to put that much more, I don't know what they call it, the transistors on the, the, the silicon, right? So he, just, he basically made the prediction that it'll become twice as powerful every year to year and a half. It will double. And I also think that he said, he also thought that the cost would stay constant, meaning it's not gonna cost twice as much to make it twice as powerful, or in some cases the cost might even come down and it will, down, it will, it will, it will slice in half. So the price will come down in half and the power will go up double. And he made these predictions based on just looking at what it took his engineers to improve the computing capability, mm -hmm. right? Exactly like you could have made a prediction about these jump drives that you referred to with space. You could have said, you know what, I bet you we're going to double the space and cut the price in half every year. And so that prediction, this graphic is showing that Moore's law was accurate. And as a matter of fact, it was more than accurate because it was more than doubling. So Gordon Moore underestimated. And the graphic is showing you that on a log scale, if this was a kind of a linear line and it wasn't curving up, it was a linear line, on a log scale, it means that this has been doubling in its computing power consistently for over 100 years, which just means it's an exponential trend. By definition, that's what exponential means. It means it's a doubling pattern versus a linear pattern. So rather than going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and on a graphic like that, right? You do one, double the two, double the four, double the eight, double the 16, double the 32, double 64, double 128. Exponential versus linear, got it? Okay. Um, and so what this graphic is showing is that what he predicted was happening before he predicted it and it's happening after he predicted it. It is doubling. And the other thing that is interesting is nothing that's happened in world history is showing that this trend is stopping. So you don't see the Great Depression or 9-11. You don't see World War II. I bet you won't even see a blip from the coronavirus on this, mm -hmm. meaning that the computing power and its doubling pattern continues regardless of any world events. It's, it's not being affected by world event events. Matter of fact, some world events might even speed it up. Exactly. You could argue that something like the coronavirus maybe has resulted in biotechnology we need to advance it quicker. People are trying to get quantum computers up and running to solve some of these problems. It's actually, it's actually probably accelerating this curve because people want stronger computers to be able to use artificial intelligence and quantum computing and these new tools to basically figure out what happens with these pandemics in terms of being able to molecularly engineer them, right? And understand how to prevent them. So you, you get my point, right? And this is out of Ray Kurzweil's book. He wrote a book. I'll show you the, the book here. I'd argue that this book somewhat changed my whole perspective on life because it's a very technical book, meaning it's, which I like, because it's got lots of data in it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's outdated now because it's, I mean, what year did he write this? This was um, 2005. Well, it's not outdated, but it's 2005. Technology was very quick. But this graphic you're seeing here is out of this book. And Ray Kurzweil was a board member of trustees, a board of trustees member at XPRIZE. He's the co-founder of Singularity University. Uh, Ray Kurzweil has invented a lot of the technology that's used today. I mean, he's invented, he's got patents on some pretty yeah. disruptive tech. I don't know if you ever have watched Stevie Wonder or ever watched 
a band playing a synthesizer keyboard, but it's a Kurzweil keyboard because he invented the, the Kurzweil piano, the, the, synth, the keyboard. Anyways, um, I'm not doing him justice. He works now at Google as a, a director of artificial intelligence at Google. Um, Mark, um, no, no, it says that um, in high school, she read that book, I think. Um, what, did, what did you read it for? It, it, I would just read books for like, for fun. Like back then I would read a, book, a lot of books for yeah. just fun. How did you find it? Like, that's pretty cool. Well, I mean, to be honest, like most of those books were in sections where like people that have like won more Nobel Prizes and like very esteemed writers are. Oh. And it was like somewhere in there. That's where I would always go to look for my books. That's why. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, it's a New York Times bestseller. Look, at he's got tons of credibility. I mean, he's a, you, at one point, at one point, I'll see if I can get him on the program. Mm -hmm. um, he's an amazing person. Uh, Peter D. Vandis and Ray Kurzweil co-founded Singular University up at NASA, um, which I've worked a lot with them. Um, anyways, I, I, I'm not doing him justice because he's one of the most prolific inventors. A lot of people like Bill Gates and others say that if, here's a quote by Bill Gates on the back of this book a radical and optimistic view of the future course of human development by the best person I know at predicting the future of artificial intelligence. So a guy just has tremendous credibility. Um, some, you know, some people have gotten, some people have gotten a little bit into this singularity. I'll tell you what singularity means. Some people have gotten into it almost like a, I don't want to use the word cult, <laughs> but some people have taken kind of this weird spin on it and they look at it, as the future of, you know, it's kind of like your, um, what's that movie called? Uh, the Matrix, right? So some people get really fantasy about this stuff. Ray Kurzweil is not fantasy. Ray Kurzweil is, here's the data, here's what's happening. But basically it just shows what you're looking at here, right? Which is this technology is advancing very quickly. And he predicted a lot of the things that we're experiencing today. He predicted that we'd have computers that only governments and businesses could afford. Now everyone has them, stuff like that. You know, it makes a lot of sense actually when you read through it. But he also predicted that before I ever heard of augmented reality and virtual reality, Ray was talking about it in 2005. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's 15 years ago in technology world. That's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. and he wrote a whole book on it, but he was talking about AI and robotics and 3D printing and virtual reality and augmented reality and biotechnology, all the things that we experience today. He was just you know, running the numbers on it and predicting these capabilities almost to a T, right? Okay. So my point is, um, it's very hard for human beings to think exponentially. So when I shared with you that this trend has been doubling for a hundred years, it's hard for us to comprehend how fast that is and what that means as far as what each doubling releases on the world. Uh, leash, you know, releases up, re releases on the world, right? So let me show you a couple other things. Um, this is, I went into Microsoft Excel, okay, and I took this trend off of a log scale. If you take a trend, see how, see how it's got doubling, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32? That's, I plotted it, but it's not on a log scale, meaning it's just showing you it's a straight line when you do a doubling like that. When you put it on the log scale is when it, it converts to this because now you can see the doublings when they get really high, mm -hmm. okay? And this is what computing power has been doing. So what happens is it's very deceptive because the doublings look really small. So in the beginning, you know, a good example would be if we want to use your example, Marco, this thumb drive, mm -hmm. you know, we think it's been, the doubling has been pretty significant. I bet you if we mapped out and did the research, we'd find out that these things have been doubling every two years or something, and they've been coming down in price, right? You got to keep in mind, it doesn't stop today. This is going to double again. So if it took us 10 years, Marco, since you said you were in high school and five years ago when you started using these, and you've already seen the leap it made? Yeah, I already, I mean, I already had like four terabytes just right here. Yes, right? So my point is, you're not going to have to wait five more years to observe that change, you're gonna wait 12 more months. You're gonna make wait one more year because it's gonna double again. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? So the hard, the hard thing for us to do as people is we think, and I wanna use a real example, Marco, so I'll use your example. When I was 16 years old, I would buy these things for like $30 and I'd only get eight, eight megabyte or eight, eight gig. 
Now you just have four terabytes. That's like, that's way more than doubling, right? That's, it, it's a, that's a thousand megabytes as a terabyte and you got three. So we're talking about like 10X, right? Not just a doubling. The point is when you can first recall that you were buying these things and you're observing them and now you just showed, I don't know if we ran the numbers, let's say it's gone up a thousand times. Mm -hmm. To make that again, it's not gonna take another five years that you experience. It's just gonna take another doubling, which is another year. So if we check back here this time next year, you probably would be showing me instead of three terabytes, it's six terabytes and it's half the price. Mm -hmm. Or it becomes completely obsolete. It's like now we don't even have to measure it. It's on, it's on the cloud and I can get a 10,000 terabytes for free, mm -hmm. right? Because it's ubiquitous, it's, it's digital. So it's very deceptive in the beginning, meaning you, you, you don't really understand how, what the magnitude is and then it becomes disruptive because it's, it's the doubling start to be so dramatic. Because when that, when that access to that type of terabytes of storage, in your case, or computing power, when it gets to be that dramatic and everybody has access to it because it came down in price, world changes. That's a world changing event, right? Like that's crazy. I mean, you can already see some of the world changing events happening like even coronavirus, you know, they're talking about coronavirus. Could it have been, ten it could have potentially been designed in a lab for sure. They're even looking into that, right? There's some speculation that it was not because it would not be feasible. It's definitely feasible. They just don't know if it happened in this instance. But it's only feasible because gene editing technology like CRISPR-Cas9 yeah. has come down in price to where you can get downloaded off the internet and with a high school education, you can edit genes, right? And that was only, that's a good example of like something that changes society as soon as it happens, like someone could create a bioterroristic virus, like coronavirus to create a pandemic. They can also do very good things with it, like solve, you know, cure cancer. And um, sickle cell anemia, there's an episode we'll watch on 60 Minutes where they show this CRISPR-Cas9 when we talk about biotech. It was used to completely reverse uh, a patient's uh, sickle cell anemia to make her completely healthy. But these are, do you, see, do you realize how dramatic these are? These are things that change the world forever when these technologies hit that disruptive phase. Because everybody has access to it. It's super cheap. You call that democratization. Democratization meaning everyone has access. Doesn't matter if you're a high school student in South Central LA or you're a PhD graduate at Stan or PhD at Stanford University, everybody's got access to CRISPR gene editing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's cheap and it's and it's continuously getting better. It's not stopping here. So this is, and I'm borrowing Peter Diamandis, who's a good friend and someone I have great respect for and admire, who's also changed my life. Um, he wrote the book Abundance. He wrote the book, The Future is Faster Than You Think. He'll definitely be on this program at some point. You can watch tons of videos of him online, but I'm borrowing his language here. He calls it that he had come up with six Ds, that when something's digital, it becomes, it has this deceptive phase, then it becomes disruptive, then it becomes democratized. It also becomes, it also dematerializes like the jump drive meaning you're going to start using cloud computing. You don't even need this anymore. So it dematerializes. Um, and it doesn't stop here, like I said, because what we're talking about now is quantum computing. So do you see how, do you see how electromechanical relay, vacuum tube, transistors, integrated circuit, that's computer evolution, right? Mm -hmm. The next type of computing that is being built right now, which you hear a lot about, about, and there's a lot of news on it, is quantum computing. In quantum computing, we'll spend a whole session just on quantum computing and talk about it, but it's very fascinating because what it's doing is it's trying to use completely new forms of computing power to do those calculations per second. And the leap is not gonna be a doubling leap. It's gonna be a quantum leap. <laughs> and you hear see this quote, Microsoft, is now almost a decade into a project that has just begun to talk publicly about it succeeds the world's because if it succeeds the world changes dramatically it was in 2014 so this is already six years ago right theorists have said that a machine a quantum computer could solve a problem that today's fastest computers it would take it hundreds of millions of years to, to solve and a quantum computer would solve that in a moment 
we're talking about a very, very dramatic increase in computing power. If you look at the leaders in quantum computing right now, it's Google and IBM and a few others, but they just declared that they feel they reached quantum supremacy, which means a quantum computer was used to do something better than a, today's fastest computers. They declared that I think it was last year was in the news and there was a little debate about it. But the point is, this is gonna happen. It's just, it's inevitable. We will have quantum computers. There's also DNA computing. Uh, using DNA. There's a lot of new methods coming in because we're just evolving computing power, right? So this is going to continue and it's probably going to continue where this pacing gets a lot faster than just doubling, right? It's time to, here's 2017. Um, IBM has announced it's launching the world's first commercial quantum computing service, which allows people to make the use of quantum hardware via the internet. It's probably going to be free too. The most powerful computers in the world that computing that takes today's computers millions, you know, hundreds of millions of years to solve. I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? But it's, it's, it will t we'll dive into quantum computing. You'll see why this is the case. I mean, it's a very technical reason why, but it's a pretty extraordinary thing if you guys go do a little research on quantum computing. Now, where would that be valuable? Quantum computers will be good at some things and some things they won't be good at. One thing that they have, think it has a lot of promise in is if you wanted to mimic the pandemic we're in right now with the coronavirus. A quantum computer, theoretically, what they're trying to do is use quantum computing to simulate the whole genetic structure of the virus that we're dealing with right now and understanding and testing different drugs against it in a computer simulation. Today, that we, we don't have computers that can run that much computational power to actually say, here's a digital twin of the virus. I Meaning we took the virus, COVID-19, or the coronavirus, we put it into a computer simulation. So we, we put a digital twin of it in a computer simulation, but then we tested different type of drugs against it in a simulation and we actually model the way the virus would react. Today's computers, we're trying to do that with traditional computers today, and it takes a long time. That's why you don't see cures that happen overnight. Quantum computing will do that simulation very fast. So we can actually, that's a real practical example, okay? Um, so here's the fun part, because this is where I want us to have this perspective shift. And again, I borrow this from, this exercise that Peter DeMandis does, if this is gonna help you understand what linear thinking looks like versus exponential thinking, and then you really will be exponential entrepreneurs, okay? <laughs> You'll know why we've tagged this exponential entrepreneur. Yeah. Instead of thinking about what happens in the next 30 years with this double padding with Moore's law, let's think of it in terms of linear versus exponential in terms of distance because we can, our brains can relate to this because we can predict how far it is to get somewhere, right? In physical distance. So if I took, a meter is about three feet, right? So if I took 30 steps linear, so I went 30 meters because each step was a meter. Again, meter being about three feet, you know where you would be. So Pablo, if you stood up right now and I said, take 30 steps, like a stride where you cover about three feet, you know, just kind of a, a, and do that 30 times, you can probably look around your room right now. You don't even have to look around your room. You probably can just in your head, you can think, I know exactly where I would be if I did that, a big a lunge 30 times. You know, I would be out of my bedroom, out of the kitchen, out the front door, probably at the sidewalk of my house, roughly speaking. You're probably, you're probably pretty accurate because it's so easy for us to think in linear steps. And if I said, Pablo, where would you be if you did that halfway? It's easy to figure that out because half of 30 is 15, right? Mm -hmm. So 15, 15 strides away. And you know, I'd be in the kitchen instead of outside the door or what have you, right? So it's easy for all of us to do that. And the reason I'm overemphasizing this is because I want you to think how humans are wired, the way we think. We think linear. Like that's the way we perceive everything. It's very natural to us. Um, now, if I asked you to do 30 exponential steps, right? One, and then I wanted you to take two, then I wanted you to take four, then I wanted you to take eight, then 16, then 32. If I asked you to do 30 meters, but do it exponential steps, so you doubled instead of doing it linear. Physically, obviously physically you would be one, two, 
four, eight, 16, 32. I've done six doublings and I've gone already 32 meters. So you're already at the sidewalk, Pablo, and you're already six doublings into it. You got 24 more to go to hit the 30 doublings, right? If you'd extrapolate and said, okay, I wonder if I keep doing this, because obviously you're past the linear model, where do you think you would physically be if you just kept doubling another 24 times? Because you've already taken six doublings, which got you to the 32, right? You guys tracking with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll be in downtown. Okay, so you think you go, and downtown is probably a mile away? About two miles. Two miles away. So yeah, so if you doubled two, four, eight, 16, 32 meters, 64 meters, 128 meters, 250 meter, two, you know, you would be, you think you'd be downtown, right? What if I said to you, you could maybe get all the way from California to New York? You'd be doubled 30 times. The reality is you would go 26 times around the planet if you doubled 30 times. Whoa. All right. That's how deceptive this is. If you take a calculator and you double one, two, four, eight, 16, 30, see how deceptive it is? 256, you've already doubled seven times, and you're only at 256 meters. It doesn't seem like you could get 20, it, that, you know, that's, that's just a little farther than your driveway, right? You didn't go that much further. But if you keep that pattern up 24 more times, you, you go around the planet 26 times. You would circumference the earth 26 times, Pablo, in that example. And you know what's crazy? is like, um, cause I, I think I've, I've done this activity in the past. Um, yeah, you did it with me. And when we did that, when we did exponential entrepreneur, your high school. <laughs> yeah, we did a, we did like the, I think a leapfrog, like the, a, like a, you know, like lily pads or something. We're like growing in a lake and then it took over like, well, like on what day, um, did the, was a whole pond full of like lily pads. Um, and it's deceptive because, um, you know, you see half of the, of the, of the, of the whole lake full with lily pads and you're like oh we still have a few days but no it's like it takes yeah. one more day because it's double and then exactly so marco you're answering this question i'm glad you bring it up here's the kicker right when are you halfway in this model in the linear when were you halfway in the linear model 30 meters when were you halfway 15 half of 30 is 15 so 15 meters and in your head you can see I'd be halfway to the 30 at 15, and then I can see if I took another 15 strides, I'd be 30 meters, I know exactly where I would be. You can predict and you can forecast, right? When am I halfway in this model? <laughs> Think about this, guys. If I'm doubling 30 times, when I'm doubling 30 times, when I'm at the 29th step, I doubled the, to the 30, to the, mm -hmm. I'm at 13 times around the world when, when I'm 29th step, and then I double it to be 26 <laughs> times. So it's the very last moment you realize your FUBAR. You know what FUBAR stands for? No. It's from an old Mel, it's from an old, it's from an old Mel Gibson movie that you have to go watch. I can't repeat it. It's F up beyond all recognition. <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's a phrase from a movie. But that's when you realize you're toast and it's too, by that time it's too late. In an exponential pattern, you're halfway there. If, when you realize you're halfway there, it's too late if you just start to prepare. Because the very next doubling, you're there. You get it? So again, if I go back to these graphics we had here, especially this one here, this is, see how it doubles up to a billion? There's the math right there. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4090. Look what happens towards the end. 134 million to 268 million to 536 million to a billion. You see how it doubles and it sneaks up in you. You guys, this is why everyone's freaking out over coronavirus. Because what do you hear about coronavirus? It's exponential growth. It's exponential growth. It's doubling what? Every, I think they were predicting every seven days it was doubling. Yeah. So you see what happens? That's why all the professionals and scientists are like, guys, humans don't think like this. Humans want to go outside. They think this is under control. They think it's not very serious. It seems very, you know, that's the deceptive phase. But if the pattern keeps doubling, if they say this is an exponential trend, you have to be aware of this. It's going to sneak up on us. And next thing you know, it's going to double. 
right? So what you've seen happen in 30 years is gonna double in the next year or two in terms of advances in technology, right? And this is computer power. So what happens, you guys, is anything that becomes digital now becomes exponential. So anything that's riding this curve, which are digital things, because they're using computing power, anything that uses computer power, that uses Moore's law, can be an exponential trend. That's why artificial intelligence is directly related, well, not directly related, but it's riding this curve. It's riding Moore's law. Virtual reality, augmented reality, drones, biotechnology, 3D printing. 3D printing's been around for over 35 years. Just now it's hitting its big doubling phases where it's hitting the, it's out of the, it's out of the deceptive phase into the disruptive phase. And this is what graphic is in this book because Ray Kurzweil, you know, Bill Gates was saying he's the best at predicting artificial intelligence. Ray Kurzweil just ran the math here. He's not, he's not making any scientific science fiction prediction. He's making something based on data. And he's basically saying, we, can, we know how fast the brain calculates per second, the human brain. Because you can use instruments to figure out how many calculations per second a human brain does, right? So we know this. We know about a mouse's brain, about an insect's brain. By 2023, today the, 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 that Intel chip that's in my computer right now is already calculating faster than a mouse's brain calculates. What I can buy for $1,000 in my computer, the one we're using to run this Zoom call, right? Within a few years, Ray's prediction is we'll hit the calculations per second around 2023, 2025. We'll have a breakthrough where calculations per second that a computer go, does for $1,000 is equivalent to what a human brain does in calculations per second. And by 2050 is all the human brains on the planet, all of civil civilization's brain power in calculations per second will be in a computer chip or whatever form that computer takes, um, quantum computing or what have you, for $1,000 or less, you'll have the computational power of the human planet in terms of brain power. Well, that's crazy. Because like, I feel like that phone is a very, like if it's like, if there's a chip or some computer that has all human like brains, like the power of all human brains, that like, that poses like a huge, I mean, I imagine it, pose, it could pose like a huge security risk for like. Of course, yeah. There, well, there, think about it. A calculator from 10 years ago can calculate better than a human brain can, right? So it's not like, it's not should be no surprise that computers are gonna get sophisticated yeah. enough to have this type of computational power. The thing is, you then overlay something like artificial intelligence on this curve, and AI is using that tremendous computing power. It already is using, in the last few years, you've heard about machine learning, where computers, because of that immense computing power, are learning to teach itself, and that's called machine learning. And we'll talk a lot about that, but we're in this new phase of artificial intelligence, this new phase of AI. AI has been around for decades, decades. You know, there was an AI that beat a, check, a checker player, then a chess player, then more recently Atari games and the game Go. I mean, there's, there's this progress where you've seen AI, but it's, it's riding this a curve like this. So you can't think it's going to take another 50 years for that to advance like it did for, you know, me, Marcus, in my lifetime, what I've seen it do. You guys are going to experience that. We're all going to experience that in a, in a very deceptive phase where it's going to double and we're just going to, it's, we're going to wake up one day. And that's, it's kind of what we're living through right now is this period of time where we're kind of waking up every day. There's like some big breakthrough because it's just, it's just this much computing power being applied at such a cheap price and everybody has access to it. You got to keep in mind if it's just one person, right? You know, Ray Kurzweil and other artificial intelligence experts were the ones that were using AI. Now you've got potentially hundreds of thousands of people having access to AI with Amazon's, you know, AI as a service in the cloud type of thing. So you really just have this effect where you've got not only the higher computing power, but you've got more people having access. Um, by the way, the word singularity, if you're wondering what it means, if you've, ever, if you've ever read a book about physics, there's a good book here. Um, one of my favorite books is um, you guys have of course heard of Stephen Stephen Hawking, mm -hmm. right? Super famous. So he wrote a brief history of time, which is just an absolutely incredible contribution to the world. 
<laughs> this is the universe in a nutshell. In this book and in the other books, he talks in physics, he talks about a point of singularity when he talks about black holes being so dense that light can't escape gravity and it condenses into a black hole. Okay, crazy, crazy shit, right? <laughs> he writes all about it and all the, you know, all the stuff he's proved that black holes exist, but he, what the, what's, and I'm gonna get this a little bit wrong, but for in layman terms, they don't really know what happens at that point in a black hole because it's such a crazy concept that gravity gets so dense that escape, light can't escape and therefore creates a black hole in the universe. They, they think that, and, and Stephen Hawking talks about, that's how you could do time travel. He says, if you could send a body through a black hole, it would, it would take you into another dimension of space and time and you would do time traveling. Crazy stuff. I mean, this is, he's not a science fiction writer. He's one of the world's best scientists, right? He passed away, you know, recently. Um, you know, they made a whole movie about him. But that's what point, that's what singularity was referred to. It's, it's, it, was a, it was a phrase that was coined as, I, basically, in my opinion, what it means is like the, the scientists throwing up their hands and saying, I don't know what the hell happens after that. Like, I don't know what's going on with this black hole. I just know it gets so dense and our models can't model it after that. It's so hard to model because it's such an intense thing. So Ray Kurzweil kind of borrowed that term on singularity to describe what happens when the curve gets vertical. And you see computer power advancing in moments and you see artificial intelligence advancing what we're used to in a lifetime, AR advances in a moment. And then you're in this renaissance of invention and innovation like we've never seen before because the, the, the power of artificial intelligence is so strong, it's inventing so quickly that mm -hmm. it's, we can't, even, we can't even observe, as humans, we can't even see the exponential trend anymore. It's just ridiculous. Imagine the 30, you know, the billion going to 2 billion, going to 4 billion, going to 8 billion, going to six, you know, 16. We're talking about changes that, we're so used to that deceptive phase in our history because we think so linear, we just can't comprehend it. So he, he, put, he says that's what is called the singularity is near. And he basically said that that point at which computing power gets so advanced and artificial intelligence advances with it to where it makes changes in splits, you know, in instances that we're used to seeing in lifetimes, the world will be completely different. And he calls that the point of singularity. And he takes a very you know, it takes a very technical approach to what it is. And then of course, you guys, there's tons of literature around the ethical and moral issues and considerations with that whole thing. I mean, he's not trying to take a position on that per se. He's just trying to show what the data is showing. You know, he's not trying to be controversial. He's just showing what the data is showing. And we're seeing that play out now. So you have a lot of uh, philosophers and a lot of social scientists and a lot of people that are into, you know, that study ethics and morals to think about what should the world and could the world look like in that case. Because as you point out, Marco, that's a crazy thing. That gives ridiculous power with, you know, Spider-Man's the one who said, um, <laughs> with, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, he did. Right? Yeah. There you go. And so you see some organizations like XCRIZE, where I was CEO for, for a couple of years, I just admire the work they were doing. I admire work they continue to do because what they, re they recognize all this, you know, Peter Diamand has founded XPRIZE because they're trying to get this technology to solve big problems and be used for good, not being used for, for bad. <laughs> but the reality is it'll be so democratized and so many people will have access to, it, it'll be difficult to control, not to scare you, but it's something, if you guys wanted to get into a profession where you advise people on the moral ethics of society and how society is going to change, it needs a lot of people looking at this. You know, it's going to change everything, education, healthcare. P Peter's philosophy, Peter, Peter likes to make the case for abundance, which is, he, he, he piggybacks on Ray Kurzweil's in this type of discussion. And he, he has a very optimistic point of view. He thinks it will make an abundance of healthcare. Everyone will have amazing healthcare. Yeah. You'll have abundance of education, like we've discussed here. You'll use virtual reality, augmented reality, and whether you're Larry Page's kids or whether you're your kids, you'll get the same education because you're all having access to AI that's teach. So there is this theory of abundance, which which Peter subscribes to. I, I am a little bit, I'm a little bit in a situation where I just think the bridge to get there is going to be very precarious. It's going to be very high risk, and society will have a lot of time adapting to that change. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because we're not good at change. Governments aren't good at change at all. So I know, you, I know you guys have a lot of passion for doing work in politics or at least governments and government affairs. 
the biggest challenge I think is government's ability because government is completely linear. It's set up to be linear. It's set up to be risk adverse and structured and process and unfocused. And everything government touches tends to be somewhat linear. And I'm not talking about the people inside. I'm just talking about the institution itself. It's just not wired to be agile and adaptable. Some companies can't, can't be that way either. So anyone who's linear thinking is going to basically be disrupted and probably if you're a business, you'll be put out of business if you think like this. And if you're a government, you're going to have a real hard time playing the function that a government tries to play. Is, um, is, is there a such thing of like a curve that it gets so like crazy that it kind of starts to retract back? So instead of a linear curve being like this, an exponential curve being like this, like the curve kind of starts to... No, know. because the cur remember the curve is, the curve is time. It can't go back because it's, it's, it's just going to go up. It's not going to go back because back is going back in time. Yeah. So, but the curve, the singularity is when it becomes vertical. Yeah. It's no longer like doubling. To, it's like it's literally on a, the math looks like vertical. Just by the way, just like the curve looks when you put it into this graphic, right? It's almost vertical. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the coronavirus graphics, it's showing an exponential trend. And so you can spot these exponential trends all over. And we don't have time to get into it, but I'm just sharing with you there is so much data behind, behind this that it's not a philosophy or theory. It's, it's data and it's fact. It's what's happening. Okay. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur for social impact, for business impact, or for both, you just have to get yourself wired like this. Because if you're not, you're going to dismiss things. You're going to say, yeah, that's just hype. That's not going to happen. It's like blockchain. Blockchain came in. Everyone got all hyped about it. The media got hyped. They got in cryptocurrencies. Meanwhile, the blockchain technology is doing one of these. Do an exponential. It's going to get better and better and better. And so people dismiss it in the deceptive phase. They're like, ah, oh, that's not, it's not scalable. It doesn't work well. It's not, you know. I have a, I have a true story with, um, if, if, if everyone, everyone is familiar with like Bitcoin, right? Um, well, Bitcoin, you know, a couple years ago was like, oh, it's just this, you know, this little coin. And I, I, not a lot of people knew about it. Um, uh, I think, interestingly enough, there's a, there's a store owner, um, uh, who, who who owns a a party supply store, and this is a really powerful story. I, I was just shocked. I think I've told you this, Chris. Um, but like the store owner was like, someone told her like, hey, there's this technology that you should, you know, potentially invest in. It's like it's like digital coin, and and she was like very hesitant, but she was like, sure. Like she's kind of like she put like a thousand dollars in there, um, and this is a party supply. She also did, did DVDs. Uh, she also sold DVDs and rented them on weekends. My family would go and get like two or three every weekend. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, she, she made like a thousand dollar investment and then that easily turned into like 60,000, like, because like it, it turned into like so much money, which was important because like, you know, she was also in the DVD, like rental industry and that was destructive. Yeah. Like she lost, yeah, like yeah. She, she had two stores and she had to close one store, but because she invested in Bitcoin, she was able to like leverage that um you know that that online account and you know turn that into us dollars and actually you know pay pay her bills yeah now bitcoin if we look at the curve of bitcoin the price has been exponential but it also dropped a lot but that's not the exponential we're talking about here because it's not that's based on pure speculation of people thinking it's going to be worth something and getting excited about it for it to skyrocket but you're right if you bought the original bitcoin for fractions of a penny you'd be a multimillionaire right now yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of billionaires that have been created because of cryptocurrency, but that's more on speculation. The fact that it went exponential, computing power helped create this decentralized blockchain that allowed for cryptocurrency to exist. But it's not why Bitcoin is. That's more of the speculation side, right? But that's a but just the fact that we have digital currencies, right? Yeah, and I think it's you know? the hesitancy, the hesitancy that I want to get at. Where like, you know, if she would have not, you know, you know, if she had she had some disposable income and she, you know, she decided to do something with it. Um, and, you know, it ended up helping her in the future. So I think that's a, an important takeaway. Totally, totally. Like the fact that she, if you were keen and you realize, I mean, she didn't seem like it was by happenstance maybe, or maybe she was actually studying the data. But if you, anyone that got into Bitcoin early, and I know a lot of people that did, a lot of friends of mine did very early, you're going to meet Henning, who's one of the earliest guys who's, a, who's brilliant. He's helped. Um, he's one of the best blockchain engineers in the world. When he, you know, he, he's the type of person that could have realized back then, 
this type of technology is going to scale digital currency. Digital currency will be a real thing. I'm going to buy this stuff because I know eventually it'll take off like it did. Let me show you one more thing and then we'll, we'll get to some final questions. I just want to show you tomorrow. We're going to talk about, um, we're going to continue this discussion with part two, because I also want to show you this other phenomena that's happening, which is people are getting connected on the planet. So uh, I, I'll say that for tomorrow, but I want to end on a couple things. Everything that we've been talking about, right? This looks familiar. Mm -hmm. All the tools in the toolbox we discussed. These are all, the reason they're on this list is they're all following, in my opinion, well, not my opinion, but the people I'm around in the, their literature and the research. These are the things that feel very exponential. They are directly taking advantage of exponential technology and the scaling capacity of computers and storage and energy. And it's creating products and services that are changing the world for, you know, for social impact or for business impact. And that's why we're talking about these things because these things are those deceptive things. These are the things that you say, Hey, when do you think digital biology will be a thing? Just like I asked you, Pablo, how far do you think you'd get if you went 26 more doublings and you said, you know, maybe downtown LA versus your driveway. That's, you, you have to think about it. Wait a second. No, this is going to bring me 26 times around the planet earth. Like, that's how much this stuff is going to scale and how quickly it's going to scale and how dramatic it's going to be. And if you have that lens and you can kind of look around the corner, now you don't have to be an expert. And a lot of the stuff we talked about today seemed a little technical, just so you understand some of the basic stuff. You don't have to be technical to do this other stuff. You just have to know that it's exponential. You don't have to learn how to code it per se. You could, if you want to, you just have to realize it's a thing and this is how that thing works. And today it's doing this, which means tomorrow it'll be doing that 26 times around the planet earth you know, type of analogy. So you realize that, wow, imagine what this is gonna look like in a year. I can build a business on what, what that might look like. It's again, the, the Wayne Gretzky, what's the Wayne Gretzky phrase about hockey? Go to where the puck is going. Yes, skate to where the oh, puck's going. Skating. Now you guys know the puck is on an exponential trend. So you wanna intercept it. You wanna go to where it's gonna go right? Tomorrow, what I want to talk about is when you have this happening, right? And this is, by the way, just so you can see, this is the World Economic Forum's top 10 emerging technologies for 2019. Every year, they put a list of the most disruptive technologies. It's all the stuff that we're talking about. DNA data storage, that's basically the next uh, evolution of computing. Um, tiny lenses for miniature devices, that's basically the the dematerialization, things getting smaller on an exponential trend. So what we'll talk about tomorrow is how many people are now getting connected because that's one big thing that's happening, the computing power, right? What happens when the whole world all of a sudden can talk to each other? And we'll discuss that tomorrow because that's never happened before. We don't have the whole world on the, on, on the how many people, how, I've, I've mentioned this a few times, Today in 2020, what's the percentage of the population in the world that's connected via the internet? Anyone remember? 40, 50? Yeah, it's about 50%. About half the planet's connected to the internet today. And we're gonna see the entire planet, we're, that's an exponential trend, we're gonna see that double in the next few years to the whole planet. Can you guys imagine when the entire planet is connected with supercomputers with five more doublings of AI and computing power. You know, it's, it's just a really a world you got to think about in terms of skate to where that puck is going, in terms of thinking about ideas. First of all, part of why I did this, and we'll, we'll talk about that, part, part of why I showed you this was just, I found this so fascinating because for me, I got to see proof. I got to see some data. I got to see what is the underlying data that shows me something really is changing the world. And once I believe that, I'm, it makes me intellectually curious to want to go find out. Now I want to know what's some technology that's going to double like that, because that's pretty mind blowing, isn't it? So hopefully that spurred you guys to get a little bit curious about this stuff and excited that, you know, there's some credible evidence here. The world's going to be very different, you know, and it, and it could also steer you into your profession. Because when I think about this stuff, I want to do less commercial work and I want to do more nonprofit social impact work. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I tried to make the transition to that field with my work at X, the work I did at XPRIZE. Um, you know, I admire the people that at XPRIZE that have been doing it their whole career. I feel, I feel like a cop out because 
I've been doing it for business for my whole life. I mean, I do things like mentor people and stuff like that, but you know, we need more people dedicating their life full time to trying to use this technology for good, not to sell another soda. Yeah, I think, right? uh, yeah. And I think what's really important because like, we, you know, we, we're, we're exploring a lot of like topics and ideas. Um, and so like when I think about like, you know, potentially 7 billion people, 8 billion people getting connected on the internet and to like educate that many people, um, even a fraction of those, um, it's like important to that, you know, to provide like digestible information. Um, and so it's, you know, something that I am definitely going to think about. Yeah. I mean, I'll show you guys tomorrow that I co-hosted with, I think I mentioned this, but at the United Nations a couple years ago, a few years ago now, X Prize, the organization where I was CEO, I co-hosted with some of my colleagues an AI for Good Summit with the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland at their headquarters, where we convened some of the leading AI experts across the world to have the discussion. And those are very important things to be involved with because, again, you can get you can get into this, and you guys will get into this, and you realize how dramatically impactful these are, and then you can decide to capitalize on that in purely commercial ways or social impact ways. And I think you can find a path to do it in a social impact way, but still make an earning, still make a living. And that's that's the best situation, you know, is you can provide for yourself and your family, but you're really thinking about how this technology can be used for good. Um, and you'll find your own situations. I think education is a good area that, you know, that, you got, that we've already talked about because education is going to go through dramatic transformation as a result of this type of exponential trends. Yeah, and I know um, Emma, Emmanuel, who's on the, on the line as well, one of the students here today, um, uh, you're very interested in like politics. So like, <laughs> imagine you're, you're gonna be the, you know, one of the first exponential like, I don't know, like presidents, maybe. <laughs> that's the mission, Marco. That's the mission. Yes. Well, um, that's where um, uh, the presidential candidate on the Democratic side. Um, Andrew Yang? Yeah, Andre, Andrew Yang. Yang Gang. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He, he, you know, he, he's, he thinks like this because he's from this network. He's from this field. And so he understands this. That's, by the way, you, you heard him talk about minimum basic income? Yeah. Do you know, you know why he thinks like that? Minimum basic income is a term that came out of the community I'm part of because technologists that realize that this is the trend, realize artificial intelligence and robotics that are exponential trends will take people's jobs faster than we can retrain them. And if they can, and that sounds bad at the first instance, but what if those AI and robotics can also give you great health care, build you a house in minutes, <laughs> not minutes, but build you a, very, a house, very low expense by 3D printing it, give you great education for free. If some of those things that we have to spend money on today, biotechnology so we can have food and nutrients, the thought is that if technology advances that quick, it might take our jobs, but it may also deliver a lot of this abundance and therefore people won't have to work, but there'll be a transition period of time before we get there. And that's where the minimum basic income comes into play is that I'm not saying I subscribe to this theory of, of politics or, or just of social, um, of, of, in terms of where society can support itself. But that's what Andrew, I'm just explaining what Andrew Yang was referring to, kind of this notion that the government could every, give every man, woman, and child, or every adult, I think it was, I think it was every man, woman, and child would get basically a check from the government. Mm -hmm to go invest and do things with, because they've done studies on this and people when they get money don't just sit on the couch and do nothing, they actually go be entrepreneurs and they go invent things and they go do things. And they do usually do things that help other people. That's kind of the theory. I don't want to get off on the sidetrack, but that's, I'm just explaining a little bit of what you've heard in the news around minimum basic income. It's, it's kind of, that term came, when you look up minimum basic income, you see it when technologists talk about these exponential trends in robotics and AI taking away jobs so quickly, faster than we can retrain people and put them in it, that we'll have this technological unemployment issue and the government will have to think of some way to keep people in this transition period until we're at abundance of these things. We'll have to somehow maintain society's sanity <laughs> and livelihood. And I don't, you know, it's controversial because then you get into is that socialism or is that a form? Because it feels, it seems or thinks, I mean, it feels like it, like money, the government, but you can't think of it in linear past. You got to think about it. No, that's not what it is. We're thinking about the future and where the future is going. And that's just one idea that's been proposed out there is something 
we should make experiment and certain countries have experimented with minimum basic income yeah. we actually piloted this so let's wrap up with a few any other remaining questions i don't know if anyone who's on the call other than the coaches want to chime in you guys are usually pretty quiet i know i gave you some things to think about <laughs> Anyone want to share anything, any question, or anyone have any, what are you guys thinking? That's a lot to unload on you on a Monday. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I, when the light bulb went off in my head years ago, when I read the singularity is near and I just understood this stuff and now I've been part of this for a long time, you know, I see the technology advancing this quick guys. And you know, what's, you know, what makes me sad is I think there's one, it's a parallel universe. There's one group that seeing this technology move this quick, it's not even a question because we're around it all the time. You go up to Silicon Valley or you go to like a big startup ecosystem like Israel or Tel Aviv or Dubai or Santiago, Chile or Brooklyn or Silicon Valley. When you get around that and you see all this stuff, you guys, you almost think this is underestimating it, these trends. You almost think it's gonna happen faster than that. But everybody else who's not in that bubble, who's not seeing that as trend, who's not in the day-to-day -day and seeing this stuff, they're hearing about this stuff for the first time. They never heard of it. And that worries me. That worries me that society is gonna have a clash at some point when people have a rude awakening with how quickly things are gonna change and disrupt mm -hmm. in a good way and in a bad way. You know? And so I hopefully am sharing this in a responsible way with you guys because it's pretty heavy information. You can challenge me on any of it. I don't have all the right answers. I'm trying to present to you guys facts and things and not put a lot of my opinion in it. One thing that's really important, which you guys all recognize, is I'm not advocating, oh, technology's awesome, let's go and let's do this, let's be, figure out how to be entrepreneurs around all this tech. I want you guys to sustain your livelihood. And I think that the world's gonna say, change so dramatically for you and your kids and your parents in the next several years, that if you don't recognize that this is kind of what's happening around you and how to deal with it, it's gonna be really, really, um, uh, it's going to create a lot of stress and anxiety in society as people don't understand why this is things are moving so quick. You have privacy rights, you have privacy issues. I mean, and linear, and when we think linear in terms of our past, there's a comfort level with seeing things move slowly. Most of us don't want to see things change too quickly. I mean, you've got people today that look back and wish things were like when they were 30 years ago. They feel like there was less crime or less this or less that, and they think the world's going so crazy now. That's nothing compared to what we're about to see. It's like buckle up. The other thing that, if you want some optimistic point of view, Peter does a very good job of showing that the world is actually getting better. He shows lots of graphs and data in his book, especially Bold or The Future's Faster Than You Think, his book he just came out with. He actually shows that the murder rate has dropped significantly. The poverty rate has dropped significantly, relatively speaking, okay? Meaning the world is actually getting better. We're just getting fed with a lot of negative news all the time. And social media is getting us negative news because people pay more attention to negative news more than they do to positive news. They don't, you, don't even, you don't even pay attention to positive news. You know, what fills up our screens is negative news. So we think things are getting so much worse. He does a really good job of putting perspective that actually the data shows that things are actually getting better in some cases, not for everyone all at once. And that's the challenge. So I like to call this bridge to abundance, you know, which is my personal MTP, my, my own personal massive transformative purpose is to help at least be a part of building a bridge to abundance, um, a little, little part of that, because I do think society will have a hard time adapting to this level of change um, unless individuals like you, like me and others are out there educating and help people adjust. And you, you could have a career helping any institution you want, whether it's a business, whether it's a politician, to coach. A, imagine if you advise a politician now about some of these relevant topics, you know, to start speaking about what's really going to happen and design programs on based on where things are going. All right. Um, any, uh, any additional questions or comments? This is awesome. Okay. <laughs> really cool. All right, cool. Um, think of some questions we'll talk about it tomorrow because this is this is kind of the heavier stuff. But this is a this is good that we got through this. Let's exit now with our mm -hmm. ceremonial exit. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. What's this. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. Same time, five o'clock. Oh, that says Friday. It's not Friday. It should say Monday through Friday. Never mind the slide. <laughs>
the team, we got your back. Now let's go exponentially disrupt this. Exponential mic drop. <laughs> Bye, guys. See you tomorrow. All right. Have a great one. Okay. Bye. See you. Bye, everybody.